Okay, so we're going to change the theme a little bit here and get into some technology. Um, we're going to talk about Filecoin ceiling. Um, I'm going to speak first. I'm from Supernational, followed by Mark and then Tim to talk about uh, some server designs. Let me see if I can get this to go. There's our headshots, also outdated for, for me at least. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about SupraCO, which is the software side of the story. Um, my company works in alg algorithmic and software optimization, system design, and uh, in this case, we're looking at ceiling. So probably you all know, but in, <clears throat> for those who don't, ceiling is the process, the cryptographic process of preparing data for storage on the Filecoin network. It's computationally intensive. It takes hours to do. And uh, it's a significant cost for storing data on the network. It's about a third of the cost in the software as it is today, prior to, prior to our optimizations. Um, and that represents a huge opportunity. If we're looking to grow Filecoin, bring more data online, uh, and this is sort of a, an overhead. It's an essential, but it's an overhead. You know, can we cut that down so that the cost of storing data really boils down to the staked fill and the disks as much as possible? So in the current software, previously, you know, one server could seal about three terabytes per day. If there's 18 exabytes of storage on the network, that represents about 17,000 server years of compute and about $300 million. So there's a lot of opportunity here, especially if we look at Filecoin growing in the future and becoming who knows how big. So, we, <clears throat> so we'll talk about the ceiling a little bit here. So ceiling is comprised of these sort of four stages. And we, over the past year, looked at all of these in, in excruciating detail and kind of redesigned them all from the ground up. So each of these stages has different needs in terms of the compute, the I.O., the memory, the disk, um, and designing a system that satisfies all of, the, all of these at the same time while optimizing it on the fly was pretty tricky. So PC1 is the first step. It takes maybe four hours to do, two to four hours to do. It requires a high amount of data, random data access to, to perform those operations. Um, it takes over 10x the storage, temporary storage of, of the data you're sealing. So if you're sealing 32 gigabytes, you'll need uh, upwards of 320 gigabytes of storage on the fly, at least for the temporary data. Um, and it's mostly compute-based, so it, there's a lot of SHA hashing which, which operates on the cores, the CPUs. PC2 is the next step, and that's the process of generating the, the trees, the Merkle trees required after PC1. It's very arithmetic intensive, very much uh, compute intensive. There's some data movement as well, but it's primarily sequential data movement, which is much sort of tractable than random data I.O. C1 is the third step. It's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, it didn't require much optimization. It takes a pretty short amount of time, uh, even in the stock software. And then C2 is the final stage, which is the generation of the snark proof uh, for the data you're sealing. Uh, and that's required to then publish on the network and prove that you have actually stored a unique copy of the data. So, as we looked at all of these, we, we looked at all, both optimizing them all to see how could we make them lower the cost, right, and, and utilize the system fully, design and utilize the system fully so that overall the TCO for ceiling comes down. And um, <clears throat> a key insight, and we'll look at the, uh, into what some of those optimizations were, was that early on we realized, you know, traditionally ceiling is done one sector at a time. So you take one sector and you seal it. And we realized that we could do multiple sectors if we batch it and do up to 128 sectors at a time simultaneously. We could get actually tremendous optimization both in terms of the, the I.O. required and then also the, um, a lot of the batching makes the compute itself more efficient. So as we look at you know, sort of how we, we did that, we, um, for each of these steps, we kind of took them down to the bare bones of the computation that was needed to complete the work. And we said, okay, if we have Suppose we have 128 and we could design a system from scratch. How are we going to do it? How are we going to make those 128 more efficient than just one at a time and amortize those costs? So for PC1, we looked at the, the SHA hashing. As I said, it, it requires a lot of cores. And so in the, older, in the original software, we used four cores per sector were used. And in ours, we, use, um, we do eight sectors per core. So it's an 8x improvement, or four sectors per core, rather, sorry. So 8x improvement in the core utilization there. And uh, where in the past it would use 
memory, RAM, to store the, a lot of the temporary data that's needed on the fly. We shifted that to actual NVMe drives, which have a lower uh, capital cost, right, to buy than RAM. RAM is quite expensive. Um, and then we sort of amortized through the I.O. by having these 128 sectors. And so there was a pretty, a pretty tremendous improvement in the PC1 efficiency. PC2 is very much arithmetic performance. We looked at um, <clears throat> improving the GPU kernels. So we re reworked and rewrote a lot of those to handle batch operations and use a high-end GPU fully and saturate the device so we get the maximum utilization out of that. Um, C1, we, we did rewrite, but it's sort of minimal changes there. And C2, we, we did a lot of optimization around both the CPU operations, uh, cal computations that are performed, as well as new GPU, uh, brand new GPU kernels for certain steps, and then improved GPU kernels for some of the steps that were there. Um, and if we look at some of the, the changes that then drives, so the underlying system that's performing these computations compared to what was there before needed to change as well. And that's where it comes into how do you design or choose the right system architecture to suit the computation that you're doing. So in the past, a lot of dual socket servers were used. We shifted over to, or we recommend now, single socket servers. Um, the software today requires a lot of tight interaction and coordination between the cores. Dual socket, that's tricky because of the NUMA, the, the disparate nodes, and the sort of latency between them. So single socket is, it works well for that. We shifted from RAM to NVMe. So it used to be uh, SPs would deploy a terabyte of memory. Now you can decrease that a little bit. Um, and deploy NVMe instead. Uh, and you're, you're both decreasing memory requirements, but you're also in increasing the number of sectors that you perform, so it's a net big improvement. And we've reduced it to a single GPU. By making that GPU and the software much more efficient, we can deploy a single high-end GPU that can keep up with all the other steps needed. So looking at the, the actual concrete system here, this is a, one example of the reference architecture we have today that that uh, Mark and Tim will talk about more, but this, this is uh, from Supermicro. It has a 64-core CPU, a motherboard. We use 768 gigabytes of memory, and we use that because uh, that allows us to perform simultaneous C2 operations uh, with that memory. We have the 16, 16 NVMe. That gives us the necessary IOPS to do PC1. We need about 10 million IOPS, which is quite, quite a lot to perform PC1 and keep up with the core hashing. And that gives us a couple of extra then to store data from PC2 uh, on a temporary basis. And then we have the one GPU. This one's an NVIDIA uh, 6000 ADA. That's a pretty high-end GPU, but as you'll see in the performance numbers later, uh, that does pay off. So looking at the, the results, so this is comparing the same, same sort of ceiling flow from prior to today. There's a reduction in memory. Um, an 8x improvement in core utilization on the CPUs, a 10x improvement in PC2 latency, and 6x improvements in the C2 latency, the SNARK generation, um, as well as improvement in the number of terabytes you can seal per day on a single server, and an improvement in the overall capital cost of the operation. So anytime you see a 6x improvement on something that's already been optimized, to me, that's pretty exciting. Um, it really represents a big improvement in that. You remember the one-third cost is ceiling. Now that's 6x cheaper. Um, these kind of improvements, I think, will allow you know, a lot of more data to come onto the Filecoin network in the future. And I hope to see that. It'll be exciting to see that deployed going forward. The last thing I wanted to just kind of show you here is how this all comes together. So our goal is to make, when we buy the system, it's not a, it's not a cheap server. Um, we want to make sure all the parts are fully utilized. The way we get to these kind of improvements of 6x is by making sure that the system is 100% utilized as much as possible. So we can't have things sitting idle. So the way we do that here, you can see we have sort of three pipelines going at the same time. Each pipeline, the horizontal bar, represents 128 sectors being sealed um, and takes about um, six hours or so. You can see the steps there. So PC1, PC2, and then C2 spanned out horizontally across time. And you can see the red bars represent the sort of critical path for how long it takes to seal 128. And we achieve this by overlapping three pipelines such that we can use all the parts of the system at once. So you can see in red, C2 at the top, 
represents the SNARK proof for the very first batch. Uh, PC2 right below it there actually happens earlier, but represents the PT PC2 set for the second batch. And then PC1 is quite long. It takes about four hours and change from the third batch. So we kind of stacked those all up, and we tried to balance those out. And so we, when we chose the system and designed it, we picked components that would let those two parts of the pipeline balance out pretty equally so that we have minimal idle time. And it, when you keep a pipeline like this going, you can see you're pumping out 128 sectors of 32 gigabytes of storage every um, about four to five hours. And that's, a, that's where you see that 6x improvement from what was there before. So we're pretty excited about it. Supermicro and, and ICC, really, we worked with them quite closely on you know, setting up this test system, tuning it a little bit, and making sure the software works. And uh, they can talk more about what that looks like. Um, and that's sort of the, the software side of the story. Thank you, Simon. Which one is? Uh, the, the big green. There we go. <laughs> um, again, my name is Mark Zerngable. I'm with International Computer Concepts, or better known as ICC. Um, my presentation is going to kind of look into uh, a deep dive of the actual specs and the configuration of the next generation ceiling reference architecture. Um, but before I do that, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on ICC. Uh, we're a systems integrator that's been in business for over 25 years. Um, we really pride ourselves on you know, taking a hands-on approach, working with, with clients to build uh, tailored solutions um, to, that really you know, fulfill their exact requirements. Um, we do a lot of custom work um, where we will listen to clients pain points, uh, objectives, um, and really hone in on that to you know, create this solution, um, such as what we did with the SuperSeal uh, reference architecture, um, to be able to deliver that, um, that prove with proven results. Um, some of the specialties that we do, um, we do overclock servers, liquid cool technology, um, enterprise servers, standard servers, uh, storage servers, um, GPU servers, uh, density optimized servers, multi-node configurations, um, and of course workstations. Um, the slide here um, really uh, almost brings tears to my eyes because it, it, it really illustrates the uh, collective effort and the collaboration that took place on this next-gen system, right? Um, Supranational, Protocol Labs, Picnic, Supermicro, and AMD, um, we all work together tirelessly. Um, I think it took almost a year for us to really um, put this system together, um, get live access available to Simon and his team so they could run their software through it, make the uh, necessary adjustments, um, rerun that software, uh, rerun those tests, and then finally come up with a, a qualified, validated solution um, that improves performance, um, lowers the cost, and also we wanted to create a um, um, an easy ordering process for the DSA community. Um, so looking at the DSA ceiling reference architecture, um, we're, we're utilizing the uh, Supermicro hyper servers. Um, this gives us the ability to um, really take this system and, and, and then take it to the next level, essentially. Um, the form factor is a 2RU rack mount. Um, it supports single socket, latest generation AMD processors. Um, has 24 DIMM slots, supports up to six terabytes of RAM, um, has a redundant 1600 watt power supply and endless PCIe options uh, and flexible networking options. Um, looking at the DSA ceiling reference architecture, um, what's important to note here is, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, the top line, the ordering SKU. Um, this was one of the obje objectives to create a, uh, an easy ordering process um, for the DSA community. This will be published uh, to the DSA community. Um, there are links uh, that you, you'll be able to click on that will take you directly to the purchasing page for uh, this specific, uh, specific system. Um, looking at the, uh, the configuration here, again, it's a single socket AMD 9554P uh, processor. You have 64 cores, 128 threads, 128 PCIe lanes, um, and it's running at a, a, a default uh, clock speed of 3.1 gigahertz. Um, and has a 360-watt TDP. Um, memory, uh, Simon uh, touched on this briefly. Um, we're utilizing 12 64-gig uh, DIMMs uh, for a total of 768 gigs of memory. 
Um, and then for the storage, we were doing a 960 gig M.2 with 16 7.6 terabyte NVMe drives, which gives you about 128 terabytes of NVMe storage. Um, this system that we're using here has flexible uh, networking options through AIOM modules. Um, we're here, we're using two 100 gig um, networking ports uh, for this system. Um, and again, the GPU, we, have a, we, we went from a dual GPU down to a single high performance GPU, which, which is the RTX 6000 ADA, um, which again, keeping cost in check and trying to see how we can lower the cost, this has a significant impact. Um, again, going from dual socket systems that, and then also from a, a, a dual G, GPU down to a single GPU. Um, warranties, uh, the standard warranty on this um, is a three-year labor, three-year parts, and one-year cross-shipment. There are extended warranties um, available as needed. Um, so if there are end users that require, you know, next business day, um, any, any on-site support, um, having spares on-site, that's something that, uh, that we can facilitate. Um, Support levels, like, as I just mentioned, um, this is made to be uh, easy for the DSA community on a, on a global scale, right? Um, we understand that these aren't going to be getting, just getting racked here in the States, um, and we do have uh, qualified technicians um, that are able to support this type of hardware. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Tim. He's going to be able to go into more of a Supermicro's pro product portfolio, and then we're also going to open up the floor to questions um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I would just, uh, just talk about uh, Supermicro's A Plus server product line, which is our, our AMD product line, as well as our storage solutions. Uh, I'm going to cover our uh, A Plus servers, uh, A Plus storage, our JBOD and JBOF, uh, which uh, in a storage environment, uh, storage um, technology is uh, key to, I, I think, wh what you guys do. Uh, for our, our, our H13 product line, this is a reference to like the uh, AMG Genoa. So this is gonna bring technology like uh, PCI Gen 5, DDR5 RAM. Uh, and this is gonna, this, we have a variety of servers for solutions. Uh, we have uh, high-end GPU servers uh, that will accommodate up to 10 GPUs. Uh, so th that's a, you know, a great, um, <coughs> a great architecture for for uh, AI ML processing, but uh, this could be used for, as well as for your uh, ceiling processes too, if you have a, have a way of uh, making that into your uh, architecture. We also have uh, multi-node uh, multi options with our, our grand twin, which uh, come with both a, uh, a front IO and rear IO option to give you flexibility for your environment, uh, as well as ease in uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, and uh, then of course our, our hyperline, which uh, comes in both a 1U and a 2U option. And then we have our, our Cloud DC line, which is uh, more of a, a value line, um, but a single socket only solution. For our, uh, our Hyperline, um, while the uh, reference architecture is a single socket, this also comes with a dual socket option as well. So these uh, both give you the capability of having up to six terabytes of RAM. So for the dual socket, you're looking at uh, one DIMM per channel, whereas with the single socket, you're looking at two DIMMs per channel to still give you that six terabytes of memory. Uh, these uh, have a variety of PCI Gen 5 options. The 2U option giving you the most variety with basically being able to have up to four PCI X16 slots or eight PCI X8 slots, and or a combination of. These are very flexible systems. Uh, that allow you to customize them to what your needs are, what type of add-on cards you need to install on them. So that's um, uh, great for uh, an environment. Um, the, uh, these uh, are key for uh, hyper-converged solutions, uh, virtualization, uh, big data, uh, and that. So a uh, more value line is our Cloud DC line. These are single socket only. These have uh, uh, only uh, 12 DIMM channel, so a little lower memory footprint of up to three terabytes of RAM. These come in a uh, 1U and a 2U option. They are a balanced architecture, which uh, give you basically uh, what we call an AOM slot, but it's an OCP3 compliant slot. So these have uh, both a, on a equal side of a PCI Gen, uh, 
Gen 5 X16 slot on each side, as well as in the rear, as well as the uh, AOM slot to give you flexible networking. So we've really tried to simplify our product line as well by making the networking flexible. So we've minimized their SKUs to make it a lot less uh, confusing. Um, these uh, also give you basic capability, just like the Hyperline, of going up to a 128 uh, cores per socket. And um, these are um, uh, best in class for uh, serviceability. And Supermicro is, or Supermicro has just introduced uh, our, our support for the uh, AMD Epic Sienna line. These are um, uh, a value line of servers. These uh, give you uh, up to 64 cores in a socket, single socket only, and only uh, six DIMMs per system. So this gives you flexibility for um, basically a you know, lower memory amount to get that optimal memory performance. Whereas the other servers, you really want to populate all 12 memory channels to give you that most optimal memory performance. This way, you know, you don't have to have uh, 192 gig of RAM in the system. You can have half of that and still have that optimal memory performance. These also come in a 1U and 2U variety. Uh, they, we also are introducing both uh, a rear, uh, uh, front I.O. options as well as front I.O. options with a DC power. So if your um, environment is, uh, uh, needs DC power, the, uh, these are a nice option. In fact, actually, the, the one use systems with the front DC power are a nice uh, firewall option as well for uh, network security. And we are introducing um, what we call a, our Simply Double. It's uh, an AMD 2U system with the ability to have 24 three and a half inch drives. So that is a, a lot of storage in a 2U uh, option. Uh, this, they also have a variety of rear uh, options for storage with the ability to have NVM in the rear to give you additional caching for the three and a half inch drives, uh, as well as a flexible PCIe slots to, to give you a, a variety of configuration options. This is a very popular box with uh, um, some storage providers we work with just because of the density in a 2U system to have that many three and a half inch drives, as well as the ability to support NVMe. And then we uh, have uh, introduced our, our Petascale line. Uh, this line is actually uh, uh, embracing the uh, new EDSFF standard uh, based on the uh, E3.S uh, um, form factor for storage for uh, flash storage. Uh, it is a, uh, a balanced architecture, uh, giving you the ability to have 64 PCIe lanes to the front for storage, 64 PCIe lanes to the rear for I.O. And uh, it's also been uh, thermally uh, optimized for efficiency, uh, and uh, it gives you that, that support for the uh, AMD EPIC processors with, the, uh, with a variety of uh, brand names, Kiosia, uh, Samsung and um, Micron for, for storage options. Uh, and this is an uh, example of the two, two we have, uh, a 1U and a 2U server. Uh, these uh, give you the capability for uh, 16 MVME in the 1U and uh, 32 uh, MVME in uh, storage uh, devices in the uh, 2U. Uh, and they, while doing that, they still give you the option of having uh, PCI Gen 5 uh, expansion uh, add-on cards for the rear for networking, uh, and as well as our, our, our AOM slots to give you the flexible networking options for anything from one gig all, all the way up to infinity band or 400 gig ethernet. Of course, with storage, everybody likes to have JBODs to chain on their systems to give them that uh, additional capacity by having a head node. Uh, we have 60 and 90 bay options with both uh, uh, dual and uh, single expansion so that you can provide either data redundancy through uh, multi-path I.O. or multiple host connections. And today, this with uh, 22 terabyte drives, uh, a 90 bay uh, system, a uh, 90 bay JBOD can be almost close to two, two petabytes of capacity in a single 4U. Of course, it is very deep, so you really want to look at making sure your rack is about 120 millimeter, 1200 millimeters deep or you're gonna have it uh, kind of sticking off the back end. So uh, one thing to consider. I have a lot of customers that when they get it, don't realize how long it is, uh, and then they realize that uh, you know, 
that knowing that for the rack space is uh, kind of an important. And then of course we're introducing something we're calling a JBOF, which is just a bunch of flash. So this, while similar to a JBOF, this is all based on NVMe. And by utilizing a, um, a retimer card that installs into a PCIe 16 slot, you can uh, chain another 32 NVMe drive off of a system. Uh, we are working on basically making this uh, available for our hyperline. So with our hyperline, knowing that you could have uh, four PCIe X16 uh, Gen 5 slots, uh, you could have actually four of these chained off of that system to, to give you a, a large number of NVMe drives off a single system. You're looking at about a, 192 drives off of 192 NVMe drives off a single system through. Uh, through uh, expansion. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questioning. If anybody raises their hand, they have a microphone they're gonna pass around. We're more than happy to answer questions. Hi guys, thanks for being up here today. Uh, this is a less technical question because I'm a less technical person, but uh, I know a couple of you are involved in the Decentralized Storage Alliance. I was wondering, from each of your perspectives, what are going to be some of the biggest drivers to help enterprise adoption for decentralized storage in these types of technologies? Yeah, I mean, I can say a couple things. I'm not that tied into the, the front end of the DSA, to be honest, but um, I think, you know, a lot of it will come down to cost, and so we're trying to address some of that right here, right? I mean, cost is always a driver in terms of storing your data or any kind of um, enterprise kind of operation. Um, there's cost, there's protection of the data, and I think there's a lot of work going on in terms of encryption and access controls and things like that to make sure the data, if you put it in out there, that you can maintain control of it. Um, and then I think there, you know, there's a lot of discussion of, around compliance. How do you meet things like GDPR and PCI compliance needs and things like that for enterprise users who or HIPAA, right, whatever they may be. So there's, you know, I guess part of my realization even today is that there's a lot of sort of even non-technical uh, limitations or, or requirements that are on this data and what's needed to be met for, for folks like enterprise users to put data on it. You know, it's not as simple as just, oh, I want to put my data there. You have, you have a lot of operational requirements and uh, working, maybe working with some of those enterprise customers directly to figure out what those are and solve those will really help streamline onboarding of data and I think op, you know optimizations like this make it a lot cheaper to bring them on. The whole the whole system has to be solved, I think, in, in the end to get data like that on. And and each each type of data will have different requirements, whether it's healthcare or financial or just archival data, whatever. They all have different needs, right? So finding those needs and meeting them in a cost-effective way is important, I think. I think from a supermicro point of view, I think. Uh, the adoption of new technology as it is as it evolves. Uh, when we when we look at the you know the amount of time and processing power it takes, and as uh, systems get more hungry, uh, Supermicro is working basically to bring new solutions to the market. Uh, we're investing heavily in water cooled solutions, which I think are going to be the next step for a lot of data centers to help with you know that that. Um, that capital expenditure, or not, that the OPEX, that OPEX expenditure of having these systems in your environment and uh, being able to support them. So from that viewpoint, I, I think that's where Supermicro is going to assist a lot of the, basically the, the technology adoption that's going to be needed to continue this process for DSA. Thank you. We have one more question right here. So when, you, when we break down the uh, performance improvements, um, it seems that it was uh, optimization of the componentry, the pipeline, the flow, um, obviously hardware uh, as well, the, the particular hardware. Were there alg algorithmic uh, performance improvements as well? And what did those look like if there were? Yeah, in some places we had um, algorithmic performance or improvements errors. I mean, basically you look at steps like PC2, you know, that are highly arithmetic in, in nature. There's some algorithmic approaches you can do to make some of those operations more um, optimized. Yeah, I mean, there's some matrix computations there that you can, you can simplify down. Um, in C2, you know, it's pretty 
algorithmic, algorithmic in nature, and you know, in the end, you have to get the same answer. That's sort of the requirement of proving, but you can arrive at it in different ways. I mean, we optimize in C2, for example. There's NTTs and there's MSMs. Um, how you move the data amongst those components and which, how you break those up, you know, we can optimize in different ways versus the sort of straightforward way to make those more efficient. And so those, part of it comes down to refactoring the way those algorithms run. I mean, a lot of it does, and we parallelize m most of those steps pretty extensively, and we have a lot of sort of data flow um, that flows in a different way than, than just sequential data flow. So, you know, there's, there's some algorithmic in terms of changing the, or re reorganizing the function, and there's a lot of algorithmic in terms of re Organizing the way the computation flows through the system, if that answers your question. And C PC1, of course, was completely redone to do the 128 in parallel PC2 as well, but that was a complete restructuring of the, the flow, a pretty extensive rework. And one fun thing on PC1 is when you look at how much data flows through the system, um, for a ceiling 128, 32 gigabyte sectors in the time we have there, and you break that down into how much time you have to actually work on that data, you end up with less than 500 cycles on the CPU per page of data, per 4K of data, to pull it off the NVMe, get it into memory, perform some operation on it, and put it back, right? 500 cycles. So we're down and optimizing, you know, at the very nitty gritty cycle level to try to get this performance the way it is. Any more questions? All right, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>